I am Roxana Velasquez, the Executive Director of the San Diego Museum of Art, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this evening, a very special one. This is our semi-annual friend lecture, and it's a conversation about the museum's remarkable and inspiring new exhibition, Masters of Photography, the Garner's Collection. I hope that many of you attended last month briefs members preview and were able to experience this expansive showing of works from the Garner collection, featuring images by some of the most famous photographers from the 20th century to the present. Masters of Photography creates an opportunity to reflect on photography's role in history and society and to consider its future trajectory. The exhibition present, uh, presents a revealing survey of some of the most important developments in the field of photography, featuring portraiture and self-portraiture, photojournalism, landscape and urban photography, and abstract and experimental works as well. We are also honored to feature one of Cam's own works among the highlights of this exhibition. Here at the San Diego Museum of Art, photography has become an increasingly important part of our permanent collection over the past decade. This is in large part due to the discerning eye of the Garners and other prominent collectors in our region who have assembled incredibly thoughtful collections a very recent donation from the Garners of 156 works include Alfred Eichenstadt, Henri Cartier-Bresson, Bruce Davidson, Bernice Abbott, Mario Giacomelli, Walker Evans, John Millier, Sir Bobley, just to mention some of these fabulous photographers, all of them feature in our current exhibition, including this most recent donation, the Garners have gifted us more than 500 works of art to our museum. This generosity and commitment to our museum has also been shown in numerous loans made for shows such as Mary Ellen Mark, The Twins, currently on view, Gregory Crutzen, Dream House, and Arnold Newman, Masterclass. Through this partnership with the Garners, the museum has been able to greatly expand its collection and its capacity to exhibit and research many of the most important photographic artists. Today's conversation will provide us as viewers with important context for our remarkable new exhibition, Masters of Photography. Please join me in welcoming our collector himself, Cam Garner, as well as the curator of the Garner Collection, Michael Mulno, Assistant Curator of Photography for the Getty Arpar Kovacs, and SDMA, SDMA's Assistant Curator, Corey Woodall. Corey has been instrumental in curating this exhibitions and working for the catalogs. We all have been sharing challenging, trying, difficult times during this pandemic, but there's always light in the dark, and I consider this project, this exhibition, and tonight's event like a, a one that we'll always remember. Thank you, Cam, for your generosity. Thank you to all the panelists and enjoy the evening. All right, well, hi. I'm um, happy to welcome our panelists. Um, each one of them played an essential role in the creation of this exhibition and its catalog. Uh, Roxana already said a few words about Mr. Garner and his contributions to the museum. Um, the entire show, Masters of Photography, has been sourced from his collection. Um, and she also mentioned Cam's a photographer himself making uh, minimalistic seascapes that uh, we'll get a chance to look at later on. Um, and Cam, I just want to thank you um, as well for your generosity uh, sharing this great collection with us at the San Diego Museum of Art. We also oh, have gosh. Michael Malmo who is uh, Cam's collection curator. He studied photography at Arizona State University and received an MFA in photography from the Massachusetts College of Art and Design. As a practicing photographer, Mike's recent work looks at residential architecture in San Diego and the surrounding area. Um, his work is in several California museum collections and has recently been published in Nazraeli Press's second series of One Picture Book. 
Mike helped us in viewing, recommending, and preparing works for inclusion in the exhibition. So thank you very much, Mike. And it was um, a pleasure. Yeah. And we have uh, Arpan Kovacs from the Getty. He's assistant curator in the Department of Photographs, and he specializes in 20th century American and contemporary photography with an interest in time-based media. Arpi holds an MA in art history from York University in Toronto, and he contributed an essay to our catalog that gives a concise overview of the historical context of the many photographers in the show. Uh, I learned a lot from his contribution, and I'm sure we'll all learn something else from his insights tonight. So thank you to Arpi as well. Thanks for having um, me. Cam, I thought um, maybe we could start this panel just by briefly talking about how your collection was made and how this collaboration with our museum came to be. Well, it's sort of a long story, but I, I got interested in collecting photography about 25 years ago um, and just gradually eased into it, partly because financially I couldn't afford it in the beginning. So I bought a few pieces. Um, Roth Horn, I think, was the first piece I bought, who's a landscape photographer up in the Bay Area, actually printed for Michael Kenna for several years. And I realized after spending at the time, I thought that was a lot of money, that I didn't really know that much about collecting photography. And if I was going to start buying photography, I really needed to understand it a lot better. So that really set me on a journey over the last 25 years to to gradually build the collection. And in more recent years, I've been able to be a little bit more aggressive in building the collection. Um, but yeah, essentially, that's how I started uh, the collection. Great. And, and when did you um, start interacting with the museum? Do you remember your first loan or donation? I don't know. I, I it probably the Witters made the uh, introduction, if I if I can remember right. Uh, but it's been quite a long time. Um, I, I would guess well over ten years by now. Great. Um, well, in my visits to your collection, um, it was immediately clear that there were ample opportunities to uh, exhibit uh, works from your collections in a number of ways. Um, I believe this is the first time the Garner Collection has been featured exclusively in a museum. Is that correct? That is correct. And I have to say that it's a real honor to have the opportunity to do that. I think one of the most difficult things as a collector is that, you know, you have the privilege to look at these images, but you don't have the privilege to share them very often. And that's why I've been very um, um, willing to loan out um, most of the works for any type of you know strong exhibit that makes sense and mike has been a tremendous asset in sort of managing that activity as well as the collection for me great well um maybe now we can go to our first slide with images um cam you've built an extremely broad collection um and you've mentioned that some photographers resonate more personally for you than others um I'd like to ask our panelists if you could share which photographers you feel most personally connected to and, and why. And maybe we'll start with Cam here. Well, um, for me, it's probably been always been Harry Callahan. And I wish I had a good reason for it. But you know, I think some of it is the strong graphic design, um, which appeals to me. He, he has a little bit of a minimalist tendency in some of his photography. Um, I like the abstractions, and I, I think partly I resonate with sort of his history and background. You know, he was uh, very experimental about how he went about photography, and he was a pretty private individual, and I, I've had the opportunity to meet Barbara and Eleanor, uh, Eleanor's wife and Barbara, the daughter, who were subject of many of his photographs. So there's a lot of different connections for me, and I mean, you know, maybe some of it was that some of the early acquisitions that I made were uh, the Callahan images. Great, and I think Arpi, you also mentioned that Callahan was one of your favorites. Yeah, you know, Callahan, um, for many of the same reasons as Mr. Gardner mentioned, his um, sort of interest in um, 
you know, pushing the, the, the technical boundaries of the medium in the way that he printed um, and really playing with um, abstraction, playing with legibility, um, all of those things really fascinated me um, very early on as I got a chance to know his work. Um, one of, uh, before I uh, moved to the Getty, I, I worked at the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. And the very last show that I worked on while I was there actually was a, was a Callahan exhibition. Um, and they have a really strong collection um, of, of Callahan's work. And I got uh, an opportunity to really, um, you know, get to know in depth um, his practice, um, his approach. Um, I mean, Callahan is one of those photographers who, um, you know, didn't really have a formal education in the medium, uh, but became an incredibly influential teacher um, and taught for most of his life. Um, and then one of the things that really sort of stuck with me is that he would assign his students um, an assignment um, to figure out some sort of a photographic puzzle or create some sort of an image. Um, and then he would go out and do that assignment himself with the students. Um, and I just, I love that kind of approach um, that you're always, um, you're always learning um, and, and you're always sort of um, trying to, you know, really figure out how to use, um, use the medium. Um, yeah, his, his work, I, I find, um, all, there's always something new that I learn or that I see in his, in his photographs, which is one of the reasons why it has always stuck with me. Yeah, there's there's so much diversity there, but he's often coming back to the same subject as his wife and his daughter. Um, so that's really interesting to see the evolution over his entire career. Is Ed, okay, so you all, in contact. Oh. Go ahead, Mike. Sorry, I just I just wanted to interject and say, you know, Callahan in the context of the collection, I think was the first way in which Cam began to uh, collect in depth. I, I remember when I started there, the collection had moved from the walls to museum cases, and the majority of those museum cases were filled with Callahan photographs because of his investment and, and affinity for what Callahan did um, for everything that was mentioned previous. And perhaps that laid the groundwork for or a trajectory for the way Cam's collecting today. Um, photographer's work in great depth. I, I will say, I do want to just add that I, when I saw the checklist of the show, I was so um, sort of pleasantly surprised and um, uh, inspired to see both Callahan's work and Siskin's work included there in Siskin because they were teachers together. Um, you know, they often um, sort of, uh, I mean, very different personalities. Uh, Callahan was a very quiet man. Um, uh, Siskin was a very like brusque figure, um, but their pictures and they're very different pictures. They make sense together. Um, and it was so nice to see in the checklist, um, you know, a se several uh, pictures by both photographers. Yeah, and something I thought, um, you know, maybe now is a good time to talk about it since we're, it's all fresh in our minds, um, was the relationship between Callahan, Siskind, and, and Metzger. Um, I just, I, you can really see their work echoing um, amongst each other's. Um, is there anything you want to say about that? And maybe we can pull up some um, Siskind and some Metzger images also so um, people watching can see that, that comparison. Yeah, maybe I can sure. just yeah. I mean, They're a product of the um, Institute of Design in Chicago, um, a school that was um, started um, as the new Bauhaus by Laszlo Mohoy Nagy. Um, he, he came to Chicago in the late 30s, um, started the school. Um, it ran into financial issues, closed, but then started up again. Um, and uh, Laszlo Mohoy Nagy was actually the person who brought Callahan on um, in 1946. However, um, Mohoy Nagy passed away in the summer um, and Callahan didn't begin teaching there until, um, until the fall. And so they never actually got a chance to 
um, to, to teach together or for, you know, for Callahan to really have this um, student mentor relationship that I think he was really hoping for. Um, but then Callahan advocated for um, Siskin to be brought on as a teacher there. Um, and then Metzger was, was a student. Um, you know, after Metzger finished um, uh, serving in the army, he used the GI Bill um, to, to learn photography um, and was, uh, you know, chose one of the best um, schools um, in the 1950s to learn photography. And that was um, the Institute of Technology. Um, and you can very much see um, similarities between um, his visual aesthetic, his, his penchant for these sort of highly graphic, um, you know, scenes uh, in, in, in his work. Um, and they all derive from the lessons that, um, that Callahan sort of posed to his students, um, but also Siskin's, uh, Siskin, Siskin's mentorship. Cam, did you have a comment here as well? Well, I, actually, I was going to pretty much say the same thing. <laughs> and I, I think that's one of the things that why I, I really have in depth Callahan, Siskin, and Metzger because of the common thread that runs between them all. Not to mention how their imagery is, for me, is very related. Uh, it's different, but it's certainly related. And I, you know, Metzger to me is somebody that really got overlooked as a photographer. Um, you know, maybe a lot of people don't view it that way, but I, I think he's been extraordinarily um, overlooked. And I love the, the Pictus Interruptus series that he did. There's uh, the image on the right as part of that series. Um, he did a body of work around that. I just thought it was extraordinarily creative and, and interesting and a little bit of a departure from some of the work that he'd done before. Cam, have there yeah, been, um, it, go ahead, Mike, please sorry. go ahead. No, I, I, I keep losing the timing. But um, I think also with Metzger, like Callahan, there's this, this sensibility of trying a lot of things. Um, they, they, you can see that sort of pass through um, both from Callahan to Metzger, whereas Siskin kind of, you know, wasn't as, as experimental or as um, present in Metzger's pictures, maybe. Yeah. I, what, one thing I want to just kind of jump in here about Siskin, which I have always found to be incredibly fascinating, is that he started off as a social documentary photographer. Um, and it wasn't until kind of later on in his life that he embraced um, really experimentation. Um, like the, the pleasures and terrors of the levitation are, it's, it's like this really, it's a contained body of a few pictures um, but that's not something you would expect from a social documentary photographer. Um, you know, it's very graphic. It's, it's, it's almost conceptual in nature. Um, and that I think is very much, you know, I would attribute that. I think a lot of people would attribute that to, to Callahan's influence. Um, and I think that um, runs through, you know, it goes all the way to, to Metzger's uh, photographs um, also. And I should also note that that Metzger, after he finished at the at the ID at the ID the Institute of Design, um, became a teacher himself um, in Philadelphia and taught in Philadelphia for several decades. So yeah, I think he was. You... If I remember, sorry, I just to add one little note. If I remember right, he was he was actually basically kicked out of the. I forgot what it was called, the Photo League in New York, because his work was considered too experimental by the group. And he, I forget the name of the exhibition that sort of precipitated it all. Um, so he, he very quickly moved away from some of his early work, which was documentary. He did a, a body of work around Harlem that was that was well received, but it was um, it was pretty linear relative to what had been done before him. And it was nice to see that sort of departure. And he was certainly very influenced by uh, a lot of the contemporary painters of that time who he became very good friends with.
Yeah, he, right. he has sort of an interesting connection with the sort of ABEX school of New York um, that I think is hasn't been explored as much as it, it probably um, should be. So, so Cam, have there been specific strategies you've employed uh, to represent the complete story of the evolution of a photographer's body of work like these three we've just discussed? Um, and what makes that sort of compilation so, so meaningful? Well, when I collect a photographer, I really like to have, um, you know, the breadth of work where people can sort of see what their early work was like and how they evolved and changed over the time frame. From a practical standpoint, that's not always possible. Um, the work may not be available or frankly, it may be too expensive, but my preference is to have a, a really good representation. Probably Arnold Newman is a great example because we only think of him as a portrait photographer, photographer, but his early work I thought was very fa fascinating and some of it extremely abstract. So I think it sort of paints a better picture of, you know, what they, what photographers explore and how they evolve over time in the media. So it's a lot more informative to me. Great. Um, so, uh, Mike, I think maybe you wanted to say a few words about um, Bernice Abbott, who's a really fascinating photographer, strongly represented in the uh, exhibition. And we have a couple slides up also, I think. Yeah, when you uh, pose the question of what uh, particular photographer in the collection seems to resonate with you, um, its pictures, but also her uh, working methodology of cataloging a particular urban landscape and its surrounding environments. Um, this notion of uh, a survey of a particular place is something that um, you know appeals to me greatly. And of course, she you know is, is building off of her her love of the pictures that Eugene Ache made in Paris, but moving it forward and 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 perhaps creating this lineage while well, making a lineage of other photographers to come. And it's something that still influences contemporary photographers working today, um, dealing with uh, the city. Great. Well, um, let's, let's move to um, slide 11, if you don't mind. Um, so in developing the show, I encountered a few interesting surprises. Um, including images of San Diego, uh, like this uh, stress landscape on the right-hand side in La Mesa, and um, an image by Margaret Burke White of an aircraft carrier uh, here in our harbor. Um, on the next slide, there's a, that Dada-like assemblage by Arnold Newman, um, cut out, we typically know him as a portrait photographer, and um, you know, it was interesting to see just the large number of female photographers um, present in your holdings, including Bernie Sabat, Anne Brigman, uh, Esther Bubbly, Dorothea Lang, Mary Ellen Mark. Um, so Cam and Mike, since you're um, you know, so closely familiar with, with this, um, what, what do you get surprised by in your collection? Or, or what do you think are some of the unique things? Well, I'll, I'll defer to Mike first, that I'll follow up. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that that there's so many wonderful objects in the collection. Um, you know, of course, there, there's a, there's different routes and lines that that one could take. But you know, an interesting aspect are the uh, portraits of photographers that are represented in the collection or represented within the, the history of the medium. Um, there, there's also you know fabulous holdings and portfolios. Um, you know, one of the objects that I, I love to look at is Lee Freelander's 15 photographs. Um, the port, you know, and that again is sort of speaks to Cam's interest in not the single picture, but providing a picture, you know, in context with other uh, photographs by the same artist. Um, and the portfolios, as these these collectible objects of themselves, are are wonderful things too. Um, in particular, the Freelander one, it's great piece of photo history with the intro from Walker Evans. I mean, there there's all these little treats once you start to open up the drawers. Yeah, I think I think for me it's hard to find the surprises because I've been living with them so long. But um, you know, what I, I think what's great 
you know, having it here at, at, at my, you know, ready access is the ability to revisit and, and remind myself of the diversity of what, what these photographers did. Um, to me, it's extraordinary when you see their full body of work. And I probably appreciate it the most when I can go back and look at some early work and you know, as they have evolved through their career and just sort of be surprised a little bit about the kind of evolution and path that they went through. Yeah, I think the other day we were looking at these wonderful little two by three and four by five inch Sid Grossman photographs of New York and Harlem that are just exceptional celebrations of people on the sidewalks. Yeah, and I think portfolios, I, I love portfolios when I can find them. It's, it's really unfortunate that a lot of dealers will buy the portfolios and break them up, sell the individual prints because they can make more money that way. And, you know, that to me is, uh, is the last thing I would ever consider because it's important, I think, to, to look at the work in the portfolio. And Struss's portfolio is absolutely beautiful when you look at the way it was put together, it's, it's, it's a striking portfolio in my mind. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, so um, Mike and Cam, you're both uh, practicing uh, photographers yourself. Um, so on this next slide, um, we're gonna show an example of Cam's work that has been included in the exhibition. And I thought it made a really nice parallel to the atmospheric, subtly colored works that we have in the show by Meyerowitz. And in fact, they hang next to each other in the galleries. So um, to the photographers among us, I was wondering if you could tell us something about the photographic process that a non-photographer such as myself might overlook in the understanding of how photographic uh, images come to be, whether it's behind the lens or in the darkroom printmaking. Um, and if you had any specific examples that you could uh, help to illustrate these unseen techniques. Well, I, I think for, for most people that are not really familiar with uh, the photographic process, I think they uh, under, underestimate how difficult it is to make a really great print. And to me, it's not really a photograph until I can hold it and touch it and, and really have a sense of the object. And, you know, in, in a day of social media, we're so used to looking at imagery, we forget what really a photograph looks like. And, you know, I, I think for me, I, I tend to focus very intensely on, on, the, on, the, on the, the, the object itself and making high quality prints. And I think most people don't appreciate how difficult that process is to have some vision and then be able to, to execute that in the dark room or whether it's a digital uh, print in, in, in the computer. Um, in, in my case, my imagery, I, I don't hesitate to ma manipulate images. I'm more about trying to capture the feeling I had at the time that I took the image and whatever means I need to go through to do that, I, I do that and sometimes I'll spend a week or two just in Photoshop on one image trying to get it exactly right. Um, most people probably wouldn't see the difference, but for me, that's what's important to, to really capture the sense that I had when I was there. Do you find when you're editing your photos digitally and you seem to be satisfied with it printed out and then realize perhaps something's not to your liking? Yeah, I, I mean, I go through a pretty extensive process of <laughs> print it, I'll hang it, I'll go back, I'll redo it. And, and I really think you have to live with a photograph for a while if you're printing to really make a determination whether it, you achieved your objective. And, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine, but your photograph will change as you move it from one light to another light. So it's sometimes just the temperature of the light that you're viewing it can have a big impact, particularly if you're doing color work. Mm -hmm. Right. And Cam, and maybe some of that very attentive printmaking comes out of, you know, a lot of the collection is 20th century black and white photography that celebrated sort of the heroic darkroom work like Ansel Adams and Brett Weston and, and the, the printing skills of George Tice. And so you've collected these things that, that are wonderful examples of people that really know what they're doing in the darkroom 
And, you know, that sensibility translates to your digital printmaking, I believe. Well, I, it, it's funny because I should mention my, my daughter has a, an image in the show as well. And she certainly inherited my compulsion uh, about printmaking. <laughs> she, she, sometimes when she's working on a project, she'll come over and, and uh, when she's in town and we'll do some prints. And then when she's out of town, I'll send her prints and do different drafts for her because it's... Um, you know, it's such an iterative process that could take a long time to really get it the, exactly the way you want it. But I, I'd be yeah, curious in hearing Mike's view about uh, um, his photography. Absolutely. I just wanted to pull up, uh, this is a slide for later on, but uh, since you're talking about Anna's work, I thought I'd just uh, highlight that here on the on the right, we have um, Anna's uh, picture that is in our uh, exhibition right now. Um, so if we could go uh, to slide 14, please. Mike, I actually have a slide for you. Um, okay. And oh. you know, when I first saw your work, I was uh, immediately reminded of Walker Evans um, and perhaps uh, not the best comparison in this, one of his later works that uh, we were able to have in the exhibition, but his general approach to photographing architecture. So um, maybe you could speak a little bit about uh, your influences um, and how we can better understand these um, these images that are quite beautiful in their geometry and candor. Uh, yeah, so our, our uh, processes are slightly different because I sort of take what I get. I use an eight by 10 inch view camera and sort of make contact prints only. So what I see on the ground glass is what I have to accept when I make the resulting print. So, but getting back to your question of of looking at photographs from the standpoint of a photographer, you know, may, maybe there's things that photographers see that other viewers wouldn't see based on choices that photographers have to make um, and looking at what's before them and, and thinking about how that will translate, you know, as a two dimensional piece of paper. Um, things that go into, you know, dealing with photography's capabilities and limitations and um, where you stand, how you employ the camera's frame the type of lens you might use to flatten space or give it more volume. So there's all these subtleties that when looking at other people's pictures, as a photographer, you pick up on those things and, and sort of decide how that photographer solved the problem of making that picture. I, I do think when but, you, when you, for me, when I look through the collection, it's, um, I learn a lot about composition, even though I may not consciously integrated in my work, you know, I, I begin to appreciate a sense of balance in photographs that I might not see otherwise if I didn't practice photography. So I think that's another way that it informs my, my own personal photography. Yeah, of course, that makes sense. All right, well, um, Perhaps not all our viewers were able to see our one day exclusive showing of the exhibition uh, with the museum's temporary closure. Um, but the sections of the exhibition were designed thematically and include works throughout the 20th century in a variety of media, uh, including examples of color in each section. And I found it really interesting to think about the photographs thematically rather than strictly chronologically or by their um, art historical styles. And in doing so, I saw relationships between artists that hadn't necessarily jumped out at me before. Uh, one example would be um, Lewis Hines' Sadie Pfeiffer, which we have on slide 15, um, being paired with Mary Ellen Marks' uh, Tiny. Uh, Sadie on the right being a child laborer, overworked and underpaid in dangerous conditions, and uh, teenage uh, Aaron Blackwell, or Tiny as she was nicknamed, uh, living on and off the streets under dangerous conditions and, and being sexually exploited. Uh, both the images expose social injustices and help raise awareness about these serious um, issues, um, but that were um, overlooked at the time. Um, and then in, in the second example on the next slide, um, you know, looking at Jerry Yulesman's combination printing, uh, a manual process that was before Photoshop that involves multiple negatives exposed to create one print. Um, comparing this to Rude Van Empel's digital collages uh, made with computers. Um, 
And I think RP, I'll ask you this time um, as an art historian, do you have any commentary on, on these pairings? Um, and have you yourself noticed any other interesting pairings on the checklist, whether they make parallels or pose contradictions to each other? Um, that's a, an excellent question. Um, I don't know if necessarily I've been thinking when, when I looked at the checklist and the way I've been kind of um, revisiting the checklist, I haven't really been thinking about pairings per se, but, um, but more of how various themes are enacted by uh, different photographers. So, um, I mean, you're, you're, this example by Muriel and Mark and, and Hein, um, I think is really sort of fantastic. The, the, maybe the one I want to mention a little bit is the way that um, nature and landscape and ecology or the ideas surrounding um, um, ecology um, are borne out in the collection. I mean, you have people like Annie Brigman and Ansel Adams, um, who are then, in, you know, in the same collection as with um, uh, the Park Harrisons, for example. Um, you know, bo both um, Brigman and a Ansel Adams um, revered nature, right, um, and and were made pictures that were very reverential. Um, and the Park Harrisons' approach to um, sort of our deteriorating, deteriorating um, ecology uh, is a very different uh, way of thinking about, um, about our sort of landscape, um, but they exist, they exist really quite beautifully in this collection. Um, I also uh, noticed, you know, Mario Giacomelli who sort of abstracted the landscape um, in a really interesting way, existing side by side with uh, Joel Meyerowitz, for example. Um, so I think there are a lot of these um, pairings or these uh, these you know um, similarities in in themes that can be um, extracted from the collection, which I think I think really does speak to the collection being assembled in a very thoughtful um, way. And it and and I and I do see um, you know the eye of a photographer um, as as being someone who assembles the collection. Do you have any comments, Cam or Mike? Well, I, you know, it's, it, it's funny when I, I have to admit, as I assemble the collection, I, I, I wish I could say I was more intellectual about it, but it, it's pretty instinctive to me. You know, something either resonates or it doesn't resonate with me. And sometimes I don't know until afterwards uh, why that is. Um, so I just often tend to follow my instincts and it's not a very intellectual process at the end of the day. Um, I, you know, I wish I could articulate something that, that sounded more profound than that, but I think it's just following my gut. Yeah, and, and that after the fact, once the pictures get to the collection, then you start to see all these connections that are happening. Um, but for for where I come from, looking at the individual photographers in their own boxes or their own flat files, seeing them then paired with other pictures in the catalog, I mean, these wonderful juxtapositions start to happen not only with content, but these formal elements that sort of awaken a picture that you don't necessarily notice until it was next to the one that you chose to uh, sequence it with. Mm -hmm. All right, well, um, another question, um, Arpi, you wrote a uh, great essay that puts the photographers of this exhibition into historical context. Um, you shared some details about uh, photographers' lives and their further contributions to the field. Um, but you also touched on the, the duality of photography, having a role in both science and art. Um, could you speak a little bit more about this? I, I have a slide, um, just um, something perhaps to, to spark a conversation. Um, showing a work by Bernice Abbott in the Garner Collection, I, I believe, collect, correct me if I'm wrong, this, this Bernice Abbott, um, that quite literally is a representation of the intersection of photography and science. And then um, on the right, a, a Metzger, just to illustrate the kind of technical experiments that photography offers. So, Arpi, did you want to um, maybe say something? 
Sure. Yeah. Um, in, in fact, I was just having a conversation recently about Bernie's Abbott's, um, for the lack of a better term, science pictures. I think they actually illustrated a physics um, book. I, I don't know if it was a textbook per, uh, per se, but um, in, in the uh, in the 1960s. Um, and so the, the this duality that you mentioned that I sort of talked a little bit about in the essay is, is really what has drawn me to photography. Um, and it's the only um, art form, the only medium that simultaneously sort of carries the burden of truth um, and relishes in the freedom of fiction, right? Um, and and it's that sort of, um, that's what I think is really sort of particularly um, interesting. You know, photographs can serve as evidence um, which can help make changes in um, the struggle for social and racial justice. Um, when you think about the photographs of, um, you know, from, from the Great Depression and, and the impact sort of that that had in in educating the the, the general public, or you know, Margaret Bourke White's um, picture from Buchenwald uh, concentration camp, and 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 the the power of that in communicating the, um, something so horrific, um, and and I think at the same time, you know, you get photographers who are artists who use photography as a tool um, for purely creative expression, right? I mean, uh, Vic Muniz, for example, and Gregory Crutzen um, are, are sort of two uh, great examples in the collection. Um, Crutzen really looks towards um, the tradition of, of, of cinema while being very aware of the history of photography and especially the history of color photography in this country. Um, and I, I'm also, you know, I, I say all this um, with an awareness that um, photography and the role that photography has played um, in sort of society outside of the museum world, but also certainly within museums has changed dramatically over the last several decades and I'm sure will continue to change. Um, you know, when you think of um, photographs by, you know, Timothy O'Sullivan, for example, um, uh, and and the, um, the the survey photographs of Alexander Gardner and Matthew Brady um, from the 19th century, you know, those photographs had purpose. Um, but now we think of them in a very different way. Um, you know, we're, we're still appreciative and of the content of those photographs, but we were also we also celebrate them for their sort of artistic uh, merit. And so, I find that part about photography incredibly fascinating that it can have multiple lives, um, and and will continue to do so. Great. Well. Um... There, there's many works in the show that uh, fall under an umbrella category of documentary photographs, um, aiming to faithfully depict things just as they are. Um, but of course, it can be argued that no photograph is entirely objective, um, that every photograph taken comes with its own certain degree of interpretation of the subject. And uh, images take on different meanings uh, when paired with their published captions or, or, or titles, um, photojournalism. So I'd like to ask our panel, um, what are some ways photographers inject their personal opinions or interests in these seemingly straightforward pictures? Um, and what is it that, that indicates these as art? And I, I do have a slide coming up here, um, just a second, should have um, some examples maybe to, to get us thinking. Well, you know, I just, from my own personal perspective, I, I just think it's impossible for somebody not to interject their own uh, experiences or even biases when they photograph. Um, I think what's important is if you're doing documentary work, you should be aware of those biases. And I do worry at times that some of the people that are doing documentary work 
aren't really conscious of the bias that they bring to the photography. And uh, I think that's concerning because, you know, you, as a viewer, you often don't know what the person's bias is. So you can get a very different view of something um, when it's really created by their bias and not, and not something that's uh, unbiased, which may be impossible. Right, true. And in some cases with the photographers having a certain level of connection or earned intimacy to the to the subjects that they're photographing influences the type of pictures that are being made as well. You know, that they have a certain outcome in mind. Yeah, I think I I'd, I'd, uh, to that I would add that you know photography has always had sort of a shaky relationship to objectivity and truth. Um, that that's not a sort of 20th century or contemporary notion um, that goes back to William Henry Fox Talbot, that goes back to Louis Daguerre. Um, and, and I think a lot of those conversations were happening, certainly um, in the mid, late, mid and late 19th century. I think, of course, they, um, they get heightened at certain times, right? Um, and one of the things that I tend to think about when it comes to um, photojournalism, for example, or this idea of you know, photography and objective truth is, um, well, what are we not seeing in the frame? You know, um, what, is, what, is just, what, what, is, what lies just outside of the frame? That in itself informs and can communicate um, something about the um, photographer's inherent biases. Um, and I think like Mr. Garner said, sometimes photographers are just unaware of those biases, um, but they become um, visible to viewers. Um, and, and, and that can sometimes yield um, an interesting conversation. Um, so I, I always sort of tell people, you know, look at every photograph um, twice, um, look at every photograph with sort of a grain of salt, um, interrogate every picture because um, nothing is um, sort of as clear cut as, um, as, as it appears, even if it's, you know, a, a quote unquote objective document of um of a scene um i i it's it's just i think part of um part of visual literacy that i think um lo a lot of students um as they're as they're sort of learning in in, in school they miss um and so it's it's helpful to be reminded Well, um, I do have another question. Um, this one is inspired um, by one of the most popular and accessible forms of amateur photography these days, the selfie. Um, and interestingly, there's um, several works in the show that include the photographer themselves. Um, we have a slide, I believe, that starts with Aunt Brigman. Um, uncertain if this is her in, in the picture, but she did commonly serve as model for her own work. Um, also, uh, Robert Park Harrison playing a role in uh, most of his work, um, and Anna Garner here um, taking the spotlight in this allegorical piece. Um, in, the, in the next slide, there's examples of more subtle uh, uh, notions of the photographer's presence. Um, Lee Friedlander being uh, present as a, a shadow on his subject, and uh, Cortez uh, just off to the side, uh, revealed in the act of taking this uh, picture in a funhouse mirror. Um, so I'll just ask the panelists um, if you have anything to say about the unique opportunities available for artists to depict themselves in, in photographs. So I often have wonder, you know, what is the difference between a selfie and a self-portrait? Um, and maybe this is a semantic issue, <laughs> but I, I'm in the camp, I'm a firm believer that this idea of a selfie is, is a digital construction, that, it's, that it really, um, you know, 
came out of um, people's cameras, um, you know, going to their phones. Um, that that prior to that ease of taking a photograph, if one would turn their camera on themselves, it was a self-portrait, not a selfie. I think for me, the idea of the selfie is very colloquial. It's it's very much about something that is almost disposable. Um, and I would argue, and maybe this is not a popular opinion, that the the photographs that um, are in Mr. Gardner's collection that include an image of the artist, I think those artists would consider them to be self-portraits rather than um, what we would understand of, as being a selfie. But, I, but I'm open to being convinced otherwise. <laughs> no, I, I agree well, with you. I, there's definitely a big yeah, difference. I think it, it speaks to the <laughs> longevity and, and the intent yeah. of the image. I'm sorry, Mike, say that again. Oh, I was saying it, it comes to the, the intent of the image and the, the longevity that it's going to have, um, you know, and, and why it was made. But it's an interesting notion, I think, like in Freelander's pictures, to become part of that world that you're describing in, in some way. And, and maybe that impulse for people out there in the world to, to, to put themselves in a picture and say, I, I'm here, I, you know, look, look at me. Somehow they have something invested in, in, in that experience. Um, but it's gone tomorrow. Yeah, I think there are a couple of different kinds of selfies, but I, I think a lot of them are pretty narcissistic. Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, after a while you keep doing it, you, you got to think a little narcissism comes into play. You know, a lot of it is, is clearly uh, just good fun sharing it with the family and friends, but uh, you do see it taken to extremes. Uh, you know, I would point out in the collection that I had mentioned before, I do try to collect photographs of photographers. Um, it's one, anytime I can find a photograph of a photographer, that sort of is in my collection. So that's a little bit of a digression, but I, it's something that I did want to mention. Do you yeah, mind if I, I ask I like... which? Sorry. Go ahead, Art. Please go ahead. Wait, wait, what was the first photograph of a photographer that you bought? Oh, wow. Like, I'm curious to know what started this, like, sort of niche aspect of your yeah. collecting. It's, it's a good, uh, my, my knee jerk reaction is Arnold Newman. Um, because he photographed so many artists, but I'm trying to remember if I, if I had something that predated uh, the Newmans. I can certainly say that after collecting some of the Newmans of photographers, because we had an opportunity to, to choose a bunch of images, and I, I had the opportunity to just sort of choose the, the, the photos of photographers. Nobody else seemed to be particularly interested in that. And that probably made me more aware um, that that was an interesting area to, to try to focus on. I, I can tell Mike, you the most recent one, the most recent one that was acquired was a, a picture by Max Yavno of Aaron Siskin photographing. Mm. Yeah. I quite like the um, cortege self-portrait. It kind of is a magician re revealing how he's performing his trick um, we see the photographer being distorted by the funhouse mirror as well as the as the model, whereas in the other images, you're just kind of scratching your head trying to figure out what's going on there. Well, um, I think um, we're going to start wrapping up. Uh, Roxana, I just wanted to mention um, that in uh, the last decade, I've witnessed the museum's collection of photographs grow significantly. Uh, especially in the areas of, of photojournalism, uh, vintage images of Mexico. We're, we're growing our own um, collection of artist portraits. Um, and so, Roxana, just could you share your goals for the museum when it comes to photography and what successes you counted during your time here uh, in the last 10 years? Yes, of course, of course. And, and before sharing my own goals, let me just uh, make some comments of all what I have been listening from all of you. I, I think that the, the richness, the, 
that, that we are absorbing through this panel is very noticeable. So I want to thank you all for participating again. So many subjects can, can, can you know, rise just from this one hour panel. And you've spoken about portraiture and selfies, and I'm, I'm very interested by that difference. And of course, you mentioned narcissism, that we have to remember that the origins of portraiture starts with narcissism or an idea <laughs> of transcendence. Everybody, like from the Egyptians, the Fayum portraits <laughs> to today's world, wanted to transcend the moment. So there's, yes, a piece of, of narcissism. I hope everybody was like in the Egyptian times, but, <laughs> but, but yes, that's, that's one aspect. But also you, you spoke about things like surprises. What surprises you got from your own collection? And uh, let me just add from the, the time that I met you, and yes, the Withers were the ones that introduced us, at least me to you like 10 years ago, a decade ago. Uh, I went to your, your house and the, the, the first time I saw the way you collect, the way you assemble, whether it's rational or intuitive, because I believe we all have both sides. We cannot distinguish intellectually without the moving or the emotional piece. So I think intuition is very, very valuable for me. Sometimes we get too rational, too cold, but this intuition that you describe, I think it is absolutely connected with artists. And I'm, I'm sure everybody will agree with me, but I was surprised to see the way you collect, the way you assemble, the order and almost scaring perfectionism of that <laughs> archiving processes. So for me, it was a surprise. And I do hope that you were surprised the last weeks or the two weeks ago when we had that brief opening, when you saw your own collection in those galleries. Because I think that's the moment, the, the, the aha moment, when you are able to contemplate your own assemblage collection, even though you know it perfectly well, but to see it in that, on that space and playing in that different harmonious way. So that's regarding surprises and regarding uh, the mentioning that you made about balance, that you learn and, and obtain balance and harmony through your photos. I think that is something so needed today, so needed. And when I was contemplating many of the photos, whether it's Gallagher or your own photos, I see that, that beauty of that minimalistic aspect that we all need. I think in, in these days of so many noise, if you will, if I can use the word noise, which opposes music, I am delighted to see that kind of uh, good taste, if I may say that. And uh, so many, many things that I, I enjoy. Thank you so much for your knowledge. I love to let the knowledgeable ones speak. I'm just giving comments from an outsider. But yes, Corey, from the museum's perspective, from the management, we are committed deeply to photography. The museum has augmented its collection. And this is one of the most uh, joyful moments, if you will, because our growth is, has come through the uh, love or the passion of the community of collectors. The collectors have been donating and helping us grow. So of course, it is our responsibility to uh, do a great job. I thank you, Corey, for taking over in the museum world, but I, I am committing right now that there will not be a year that we won't have the, the presence of photography in a permanent display. I think we have witnessed, in, as you say, in the last decade, this numbers, numbers more than 3,000 photos have been increased, uh, our collection probably more, but also the, the, the relevance of all the subject matters that we could learn from that, whether it's history of photographers, as we said, or different aspects. But I really, I, I just want to express again all my gratitude to Cam, to Wanda, and to Anna, now that I met her, because you will help us in doing so. And thank you to the curators and the experts of photography, because I cannot see a museum without the photography presence. It's a contradiction in terms for me. Well, if I could just take the opportunity to, to thank SDMA, it, you're right. It was uh, it, it was hit me very differently to see all the many of the works hung thematically and see them at one time because I'm so used to sort of getting glimpses of the collection, but to have it uh, exhibited that way was um, 
you know, it was a significant moment for me in terms of really appreciating the collection that I built. And I certainly want to thank Corey. Corey, I thought you did an exceptionally creative job trying to figure out how to thematically put the exhibition together and just very appreciative of all the time that, that you spent doing this. And obviously, Mike, um, your work in sort of keeping everything ordered, which uh, if it were left to me, it would be pure chaos. So thank you for all your work, your work and on my behalf. And, and I should mention that Mike often helps me review images and think about images that I collect. So some of his personality is actually injected into the collection as well. Oh, that's nice to say. Well, and I got to a quick stroll through the galleries to see the show when it was being installed. And I, I was struck by how wonderful they lo it looked on the wall and the, each piece was had, had its own presence, but yet was surrounded in context with the, the categories that you uh, established to read the collection through. And it, it was just an exceptional thing to be struck by pictures that you normally see in, in passing on the walls at, at Cam's home or above you while you're having a cup of coffee. All of a sudden they're in the presence of the museum and it, it, they're extraordinary. So it, it was wonderful. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure for me to put the uh, the exhibition together as well. I, I learned so much and um, have a much deeper appreciation for a lot of these um, photographers. Uh, so n now we're going to, I think, uh, do our Q&A session. Kate will be joining us. Hi, Kate. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for a really wonderful discussion. It was really lovely to listen in. And we have quite a number of audience questions. The first one is, what can a modern photographer learn from these photos? What techniques, composition, and style can be applied to digital photography today? Um, well, I, th I think we touched on that a little bit um, during the discussion. but. You know, I think there, there are a lot of things that could be learned from, you know, photography as a, you look at the collection, because frankly, it's not all that different. It's just a different way of, of uh, you know, having an output. You know, we have a lot more flexibility in the level of creativity that we can achieve today. But people were doing very abstract, very creative, um, a lot of manipulation of the image in the darkroom. So, in some respects, not that much has changed. Maybe we have a few more tools at our disposal. Mike, I don't know what thoughts you have. Yeah, I think, you know, aligning what you said, true. I mean, it's still you're picking up this thing and, and trying to figure out where to place it on onto a particular subject. But I think the lesson to be learned by looking at the pictures is, of course, these photographers cared about what they were photographing and, and weren't necessarily thinking about making art. They were thinking about, you know, how to be reverent to what it was they were picturing. And, and through that, the art came. So to be invested in what you're looking at, I think, is a lesson to be learned. Thank you. Our second question is, how do you react to the platinum prints and portfolios of Scott Davis? Did Scott ask I'm that? I'm a fan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Scott did not ask that personally, no. <laughs> you know, I, personally, I, I, you know, I, I do like his work, but I don't typically collect contemporary photographers. It, it's just not, there's so many opportunities to collect, you have to sort of confine yourself some way. Um, so I am familiar with the work, I like the work, but um, I'm really not in a position to, to comment on. Yeah, I, I am a fan of his work, and in fact, the uh, museum did a very small exhibition of his work uh, a few years back, um, and I, we have a, a, a work of his in the collection as well. So um, definitely an important Southern California photographer for us, and the interest is, is there for the museum, definitely. And I'll just jump in and say I, I echo that uh, at the Getty, we have a work by him in the collection, and in fact, I included that work in a show I did earlier this year that was on view for maybe like a month before we all closed um, on the history of platinum palladium printing. Um, and I should also just disclose that I was in conversation with him yesterday 
um, <laughs> yeah, digitally, uh, and I'm I'm a big fan of, of his work. Thank you. I like it too. <laughs> Our next question is: How many non-white photographers of color are included in the exhibition? Manuel Alvarez Bravo uh, is a Mexican photographer in the exhibition, as well as Flor Garduño. Those are the two that come to mind. Mike, perhaps you know in the collection um, well, some, some notable And, and the, two that, the, the two that you mentioned, an interesting conversation went between teacher and student, Callahan, Siskin, Metzger. There's the relationship there between Bravo and Garduno as well. Um. Thank you. Uh, our next question is, uh, curious about Cam's view on digital photography. Did it bring about the end of a photographic era? No, I, actually, I think it's uh, create, creating and extending the photographic era. I think there, as I mentioned before, there's so many more opportunities for creative expression. And I think people get sometimes too bound to what a traditional photograph is, and that limits people's uh, creativity. So my view is, you know, some photography being incorporated into some multimedia piece of art is, is great. Um, and I think the more experimental and, and the more integrative photography can be with other art forms, the better. Does anyone else have thoughts they'd like to share on that subject? Well, I can jump in to just say that um, I don't know if there's ever really been a photographic era. Um, you know, the history of photography is all about moving from one invention to the next, whether it's, you know, from the the Garotype to the salt print to the albumin print to the platinum print to the Kodachrome to gelatin silver print to digital. There's, it, it's never been so fixed. <laughs> um, and I, I think there's so much opportunity and so much um, potential in digital photography that, um, you know, excluding it or, or thinking of it as something lesser is, you know, is a failure of imagination, in my opinion. <laughs> right, and photographs existing as ink on paper is, is not a new thing. Um, so yeah. the, the printmaking, you know, I think is a wonderful expansion of the medium and also takes the toxicity out of color printing, really. Um, and it increases the accessibility. More and more people are able to do photography with the digital format or, or finding an interest, even if it's just from their phones and maybe seeing what else they can do with it, kind of in the way that uh, the miniature cameras, the 35 millimeter um, uh, films and everything um, opened new new doorways for photography earlier. So yeah, it's just constantly evolving. It is adding a lot of photographs to the medium though. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. I think all of our camera rolls on our phones can uh, back that up. <laughs> Um, the next question is, Cam, how do you decide which photos are worth collecting? At first glance, some of the works seem ordinary. Well, um, sometimes they are, may seem ordinary if you don't have the context of a bigger picture of the importance of the photographer and, and what their place is in, in photography. You know, when you look at this piece that you have up now, you know, Sorry, yeah. I mean, that is sort of very documentary and it takes on a totally different context when you, you know, you go back almost a hundred years and look at it today. It's quite fascinating, but maybe at the time it wasn't so fascinating. Um, so, you know, context has a, a huge uh, part of the relevance of a, of a particular print, I think. And if you don't understand that context, um, I think a lot's lost. Yeah, and I think in the case of Bernice Abbott, it's one of those wonderful photographers that was able to see the present as the past. Um, and just this open regard of subject uh, conveyed both information as a document, but on good days, it elevates itself to art, too. Thank you. 
Yeah, and I think I have a follow-up question. Uh, slide 26, I, I think, um, where we have Lang and, and Rothstein, um, you know, images of the depression of uh, the Dust Bowl um, now seem to resonate with us with a, with a different sort of um, freshness because, you know, our own world and country is, is starting to experience some of these things. Um, and so uh, having that, that artist's eye to capture emotion uh, rather than just the data, just the facts, um, I think is really important as well. My follow-up question to this is about is about that context. What what you know, museums of course are a wonderful resource for giving the context. Exhibitions like this that put the photographs in a context. But aside from that, what would you recommend for, you know, someone casually coming to a photograph that they may feel is ordinary? How do they gain that context? Well, I I would think they're just sort of basic research about the person. I, I completely understand when you walk up to a photograph, a single photograph and you know nothing about the photographer, it's hard to have an appreciation sometimes. You know, you could look at it and say, well, it's well composed, but you know, maybe that's your, your only conclusion. But you know, without understanding the background um, of the photographer and what he was trying to communicate, it's, it's just very hard to sort of criticize one single image um, as being ordinary. And RPA, yeah, and sometimes you those... add to this, but as a, as a curator, um, you know, we try to make these very, very brief labels that, that give people that context or perhaps helps them understand um, the photograph. And, you know, for me, in doing this show, uh, I would, you know, write these far too long things and then need to consult with other people um, what do you find most interesting or what questions do you have about this? Things that, you know, that, that might be relevant for an art historian, like an interesting, you know, the, the average um, museum goer may not understand. So, um, you know, we, we would try to think about these things. Um, do you have um, a perspective on your label writing, RP? Oh, the woes of label writing. <laughs> um, it really is, you know, it's 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 an art. Uh, it really is an art. Um, you know, I think uh, context can be can come from a, a number of different uh, places. Certainly, research uh, is one. Labels in in uh, museums is another, uh, but also just conversations. Um, I mean, I'm sure uh, most of the photographs that are in Mr. Garner's collection, you know, came from um, from, from dealers who who know about the history of photography, um, and and I think a lot of those conversations, um, you know, send you down one path or send you down another path um, that will kind of open more doors and and, gre and create greater context and. Um, you know, I can't stress enough the importance of books, <laughs> um, and 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 that's what really sort of um, allows um, us, at least in the museum world, to move past the the brevity of uh, wall labels, which often you know give you a thin slice um, that just you know uh, leaves you wanting a little bit more. Um, it rarely gives you great in-depth information, but it's it's a fantastic start. Um, so I don't know if that really answered your question or if that was too meandering. Well, you know what? I think one more aspect of it is, you, and you could say it about any form of art. You could walk up to a painting, and one person has a very strong reaction to it, and the other goes, "That's disgusting. What you know? What is that?" Or my two-year-old could paint that. So, you know, we can all have very different experiences when we look at a piece of art. And it doesn't matter if it's a photograph, a painting, or a piece of sculpture. So that is exactly where subjectivity comes into play, right? All of us have a different background, a context, and that's why things resonate with us or not. We are individuals, right? But the thing is, uh, thank you for pointing out the beautiful catalog that was produced. But in reality, yes, it's about books, it's about reading, 
but it's also reminding everybody that what you see is not what you see necessarily. You have to go deeper and unfold the layers of mystery that each object entails, whether it's a photo or a pottery or a, a sculpture. We are very used in this uh, generations to have everything digested. And in reality, there's nothing more beautiful than daring or igniting that curiosity and, and allowing yourself to unfold, as I say, or unveil things. So that mystery has a piece of beauty. And there's nothing more exciting than really understanding intellectually. So yes, we do start things. We open those windows in, in the museums. We start igniting or provoking things. But everybody needs to know that any object, no matter if it's a barber shop, it has a different meaning. So it's an invitation for all of you, all our audience and everybody there, to allow yourselves to, to, to be, you know, really educated or satisfied in different ways. Just a broad comment. <laughs> Love it. We have one last uh, audience question. And this is, were the photos framed especially for the exhibition? I walked through the exhibit nine minutes before the shutdown and noticed all the frames matched. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we That's did. We intentionally had them all um, try to be um, as similar as, as possible. Um, just the, the plain uh, uh, black and uh, some of Cam's work came to us uh, already framed, and he had you know, a similar aesthetic. So um, we were just keeping that all together. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to our panelists again for a wonderful conversation today. Thank you to our audience for questions and for joining us. And I'd love to invite Roxana to say a few closing remarks. Thank you, Kate, but really very, very brief. Thank you all for being there. Thank you to the panelists. We really appreciate your time. We know how busy we all are in different things, but I really appreciate this. And from the San Diego Museum of Art Camp, again, thank you, thank you for all your generosity. And, and the pandemic will pass, and we, will, you all will be able to see the show because it will be open when we reopen. So, so thank you again, and. Uh, nothing else from the moment. Corey, all our gratitude for your efforts, Anita and the team. So thank you, Kate, and have a great, great weekend.